you said for turbulent flow, you use the Moody chart, but over here you use the equation. I will explain you right now, because I will make a short record. Okay. And I will explain this. Right, thank you. Thank you. So, good afternoon. Thanks for coming to this lecture. We will have a lecture today, another next week, and hopefully we will not meet anymore. So, let me make a short recap to understand where we are. So, first topic, we went through dimensional analysis, and we spent the last two lectures discussing about system of pipes and pumps. What you need to bring home from the latter topic. You have a flow, a fluid, which is flowing in a pipe. This type of flow is mainly driven by a difference in the pressure. When the fluid is moving, it will face some resistance. The resistance to the motion is quantified by the so-called pressure loss or head loss. You can have two types of losses, major and minor. Major losses are something that you will always add in your pipe. There is no way to get rid of major losses. Major losses are due to the presence of viscosity. The viscosity will induce a friction. The goal is to quantify a certain quantity called F, friction factor. In order to evaluate the friction factor, you should first distinguish if you are in front of a laminar or a turbulent flow. If your flow is laminar, you can say immediately that your friction factor is 64 divided by Reynolds. That's it. If your flow is turbulent, you have to use another formula. 0 0.316 Reynolds to the power minus 1 over 4. This is true until you will not take into account for the presence of the roughness of the pipe. If I will assign you to do a certain exercise and I will mention the roughness of the pipe, immediately you have to use Moody's chart. Moody's chart is a way to obtain the friction factor given the Reynolds number and the roughness of the pipe itself. Major losses. Minor losses are quantified through some coefficients K. The coefficient k is determined experimentally. We saw that we can have many cases. Please keep in mind that minor losses are local events. Local events means that are events that happen when something is happening in the flow. For example, a change in the cross-section, a curvature, an obstacle, okay? And you have a certain coefficient k. Typically, we will, all, we will deal with k coefficient for an entry, k coefficient for an exit, 0 0.5 and 1. So, if at the exam someone will ask you to compute, to evaluate the pressure drop or the head loss at drop in presence of end losses, you have to compute both F the contribution due to F and the contribution due to the minor losses, the coefficient K. We saw some more complicated formulas last time. Do I need to remember that formula? No. Complicated formulas will be provided. But I expect you to remember these two at least. Pipes can be arranged in system of pipes. We can have pipes in parallel or pipes in series. 
and we made some considerations about the head and the flow rate in the two system of pipes in the two systems. Then you can add a pump. A pump is a device which wants to move to drive flow. In order to drive a flow, a certain pipe has to fight against some resistances. Typically has to fight against the head loss due to the friction and the potential head loss due to minor losses. Also, the potential head loss if there is a difference in the elevation. Last time we did together two examples which are extremely important for your future. So please watch the recordings. If you are not sure about what we did last time, I'm more than happy to guest you in uh, my office and to do again the examples in front of you. Are you convinced? May I move to another topic? Thank you, guys. Last topic of my part, open channel flows. Here, the situation is different with respect to what we saw before. Before, we have a pipe with a pipe full of water where the flow was driven by a difference in pressure. Here, we have a flow driven by, a, by gravity. So a difference in the elevation, the gravitational force, is the main actor of this story. An open channel flow is a certain flow where the fluid has a free surface. By free surface, I mean a surface in contact with the open air. The most common example of open channel flow is a river. A river is flowing from a mountain to the sea due to a difference in the elevation, so due to gravity. So you can imagine that you have your river with the water flowing in this direction with a certain velocity d. Let's try to give some information about this velocity. First, you can imagine that the stronger the slope of the river, the faster the velocity will be. So if I call S the slope of the bottom of the channel, you can immediately say that the velocity will be a function of the slope. Right. Let me take a vertical view of a river. So you have your river. And water can find some obstacles, right? Can find rocks can find the vegetation, can find a series of obstacles. The obstacles in a river will mm, be accounted for through a certain coefficient n. n is the roughness of the open channel. When we have a pipe, we call it epsilon. In an open channel flow, we call it N. Similar to the flow in a pipe, you can imagine that the stronger the, the roughness, the slower the velocity will be, right? So you can add another ingredient. You can say, look, my velocity will be a function both of S and N. Okay, please. In a second. We have to introduce 
a third ingredient to the problem. We can define, please have a look, figure two, the one on the right, the cross-sectional area of a certain river, which is actually the portion of the river occupied by the water, and the wetted perimeter, that is the sum of the length of the wetted edges of the channel. So we have cross-sectional area and wetted perimeter. The ratio between these two quantities is called R A over P, which is known as hydraulic radius. The hydraulic radius is another property of a channel controlling water velocity. A river with a very large hydraulic radius will have higher flow velocity. So, you can say that the velocity in your open channel flow will be a function of three quantities. The slope of the channel, the roughness of the channel, and its hydraulic radius. The hydraulic radius is A over P. You can imagine that computing A over P on a very regular geometry, a square, a rectangle, it's easy. If your channel has a more complicated shape, can be a hard task. Of course, at the exam, you will have very simple shapes, no worries. Let me give you some definitions. So, I take a vertical view of my channel where I identify. This is the bottom of my channel. Let me identify a certain horizontal reference plane The channel has a certain slope. If this angle is theta, the slope of the channel, S, is tangent of theta. Let me choose any arbitrary section, for example, this one. The distance between a certain bottom point of the channel and the datum reference plane is called Z. This is just like an elevation, an elevation. Water is flowing. And you can imagine that it's flowing in this direction. This is the water of the height. I will call it Y. Y is also known as depth of the flow. So if I will mention water height or depth of the flow is the same thing. Is what here I call Y. I can also introduce another quantity. D. D is the depth of the flow section where Please have a look at here. If this is theta, this is theta. If S is very small, Y is equal to D. A 
another ingredient we have to add to this discussion is the top width. The quantity called T in figure five. That is the width of the channel where there is the free surface. This table tells you how to compute what the perimeter, area, hydraulic radius, top width, and so on, as a function of the geometry of your channel. You can see that the first two cases are very trivial, okay? Just a matter of geometry. Now we have to introduce something called the types of flow. We can make a first classification of the type of flow based on the time. Specifically, if the derivative of the water height with respect to the time will be zero, it means that your water height will not change in time you are in front of the so-called steady flow. What does it mean? It means that you can take a picture of your river now. That picture will be representative of any other instant. If your flow will change in time, meaning that the derivative is non-zero, you are in front of an unsteady flow. Like you, we will not consider unsteady flow, and we will imagine that our flow is steady, so no time variation. A steady flow can be subclassified into two categories. If the, the flow will not change, if the water height will not change in your river, what does it mean? You have your river where water is flowing, you choose a section. This section is representative of what is happening in any other section, here and forever. So, if your water height will not change in space and in time, you are in front of the so-called uniform flow. If your steady flow will not change in time, but will change in space, it means that the water height will be different from section to section. You are in front of a non-uniform, also known as varied flow. The first thing we will face is the uniform flow. Uniform flow, the water height will not change in space and in time. It means that I can see, I can check what is happening in this section. This section will be representative of any other section of my channel forever. It is a strong approximation, yes. 
But scientists demonstrated that under some assumption, this is um, a good approximation, something which can help, help you to understand the behavior of an open channel flow. You can imagine that uh, a uniform flow is a state of flow, it's a condition, a situation, where every flow wants to go. Let me make you an example. Have a look at this figure. So you have a very long channel with a very gentle, mild slope, which is flowing. There are no obstacles. Mm, the roughness is, is fixed through the channel. This is the perfect condition to have a, a uniform flow. Okay? Then in your river, there will be a problem. There will be a step. There will be an obstruction. The flow will change, right? Due to the presence of these obstacles. Here you have from the left a uniform flow which is going to approach a step, an obstacle. The flow will change. Can you see that? On the left, the water height is identical. Then it starts changing slowly. We are in presence of GVF, gradually varied flow. It means that your flow is going to change its water height slowly. Then, when you arrive at the obstacle, there is a sudden change in the water height. Do you agree or not? You are in front of a RVF, rapidly varied flow. It means that there will be a, a sudden change in your water height. Then water goes down. Then you reach another channel with a very gentle, mild slope. Far from the obstruction, the flow will be uniform again. Between the step and the uniform flow part, there will be a gradually varied flow connecting the rapidly varied to the uniform one. So, let me rephrase what I said. A uniform flow is a condition where every flow would like to stay. In order to prevent the presence of a uniform flow, there should be an obstacle, there should be an obstruction, there should be a change in your channel. As for example, in presence of a step. The step will induce a sudden change in the water height, will induce the so-called rapidly varied flow. The uniform flow will be connected to the rapidly varied flow through a gradually varied flow. So you have a constant water height of the uniform flow, then the water height starts changing in a gentle way, and then there is the sudden transition. So please always consider a gradually varied flow as a connection between a uniform flow and a rapidly varied one. The uniform flow is the simplest configuration where nothing will change. Water height, flow velocity, flow rate, roughness, slope, cross-sectional area, hydraulic radius, everything will be constant. The main goal is to try to quantify the velocity of a uniform flow. And many scientists during the past centuries tried to do it. For example, Chesy proposed the equation 9, saying that the velocity of uniform flow is a certain coefficient c, called Chesy coefficient, times the square root of r times s, where r is the hydraulic radius and s is the slope of the channel. 
this coefficient c was measured experimentally by Chazy. One century later, we have Darcy wave back formula. If you have a look at equation 11, you have always the square root of r times s. But now, instead of the quantity c, um, c the Chazy coefficient, you have square root of 8g over f, where g is the gravity acceleration and f is our lovely friction factor. And you should be the, master of the, the masters of the computation of friction factors at this point of the story. Because you are in the position to tell me that the friction factor is 64 over Reynolds for laminar flow, another formula for turbulent flow, or use the Moody chart in presence of roughness. Are you convinced or not? So we have Chazy, we have Darcy Weisbach, and then we have the most popular formula, Manning. Manning formula tells you that the velocity in an open, in an open channel flow is one over n, where n is called Manning coefficient, hydraulic radius to the power 2 over 3, square root of s. This is the only formula you need. Shall we make an example of how to use Manning formula? Let's move forward. Okay. Figure 10. Please, have a look at this section. This is called compound section. Compound means composed of different parts. Here we have a rectangle and two triangles. For this section, we want to compute the height of uniform flow. That is, the water height corresponding to a uniform flow, which is in turn related to the velocity computed through Manning formula. So, we want to compute the height of uniform flow. Let me call it Y not. Okay? The base of the channel is six meters. The edges are inclined by 45 degrees. The bottom of the channel has slope equal to 0 0.0002. Manning coefficient 0 0.014. The flow rate is 12.1 meter power free over seconds. We want to compute the water height of uniform flow corresponding to this situation. Okay, let's write some equations. For sure we can write this. The flow rate is the velocity times the cross-sectional area. And according to Manning, N sorry, the velocity, is 1 over n, hydraulic radius to the power 2 over 3, square root of s. Where 
S is this one. N is this one. The hydraulic radius R is A over T wetted area over wetted perimeter. Okay. Do you agree that I can compute A and P according to formulas 16 and 17? So A will receive a contribution from the rectangular part B times Y0 plus two triangles. Who is not convinced about equations 16 and 17? Please. Wait, sir, so the, uh... the base. Go to figure 10, to figure 10. And that's it. Now, we are in the position to compute the hydraulic radius, right? So at this point of the story, I know R. And I end up by writing this, V equal to 1 over N, V times Y0 plus Y0 power 2, B plus 2, square root of 2, Y0, 2 over 3, square root of S. The flow rate, Q, will be this thing times the cross-sectional area, right? Times B, Y0, at zero power two, which is equal to twelve point one meters power three over seconds. Do you agree until getting equation twenty or not? It's better to don't be convinced now rather than at the exam. Sir? Please. to get this equation as I, in, I will provide you Manning formula, okay? Hmm? Yeah, but this is something that you can derive as I did. Yes, you can do it by iterations and I can tell you stop after three iterations. Let me show you. Guys, we arrived at equation 20, right? Which is a non-linear equation where we should solve numerically. So, could you please have a look at this? You set the value of B, S, N, and your flow rate. Then you have to find Y0 so that the flow rate you will compute is sufficiently close to the desired flow rate. If you put Y0 equal to 0, you have this. Then you say, what happens if it is equal to 1? This is the wetted area. This is equation in the PDF, equation 16, where the water height is equal to one meter. And then you get this flow rate. Then you increase it, for example, to two. And then you get this flow rate. 
you can imagine at this point that your water height will be something between these two. Okay? With one point five, you get the correct result. This is something you can solve intuitively and iteratively. And this is even more difficult than what you will find at the exam. So, no worries. But please, have you got this, the problem and the solution procedure? Let me pose the question from another viewpoint. Do you want me to repeat this story? Who wants me to repeat this story? No? Okay. Let me face a more complicated problem. This is a compound composite section. Compound, made of different parts. Composite, where there are different Manning's coefficient. You play the very same game as we did before. So you divide your cross-sectional area into blocks into simple blocks. And then you sum up the contributions exactly as we did before. May I move forward? OK. At this point of the story, we have to introduce Bernoulli equation for a uniform flow. So, I have my datum reference plane. I have my channel of slope S. And I consider two sections. This, I will call it one. This, I will call it two. I will assign to each one a certain elevation. And then in this channel, there is water that is flowing. If the flow is uniform, you can immediately say that This water height, A1, will be equal to this water height, A2, H2. The line connecting all the water heights corresponds to the water free surface, right? This line is called HGL, hydraulic grade line. The hydraulic grade line has a certain slope, SW, right? Let me call this as zero. In a uniform flow, These two slopes are identical. So, do you agree on this statement? Let me apply continuity between section one and section two. Apply continuity means that the flow rate in section one is equal to the flow rate in section two. Flow rate in section one, V1, H1, equal to flow rate in section two, V2, H2. But these two are identical. So,
So I can say that V1 is equal to V2, right? This allows me to introduce another quantity. I will move from this point of a certain quantity, V1 power 2 over 2G. And here, V2 power 2 over 2G. I will connect these two points, and I will obtain that green line. The green line is called energy grade line. Please keep in mind that the hydraulic grade line corresponds to the water-free surface. So it's something that you are able to see. It's something that exists. The energy grade line is a mathematical concept. Okay? So it's something that you don't see. The hydraulic grade line, the energy grade line will have a certain slope. Let me call it SE. Do you agree that these three slopes will be identical? Who disagrees? Or who is not convinced, as I like to ask? So, the equivalence between the three slopes is called equation 39, condition of uniform flow. You might get an MCQ, an MC question asking about the condition of uniform flow. Now, please have a look at this. The sum of the three contributions, z, y, and velocity, h1 for section 1, is called the total head of section 1. The sum of the three contributions in section 2, h2, is called total head in section 2. Do we agree that there is a difference between this? Right. The difference is this one. Let me call it HL. You can immediately verify that the difference in the total head between section 1 and section 2 this quantity called LHL is equal to this part, delta Z, the difference in the elevation. In other words, the difference in the total head between two sections in the case of a uniform flow, can be computed immediately as the difference in the elevation of the two considered sections. Someone disagrees? Okay, the very last thing for today. We define types of flows, but we also have to introduce the states of the flow. In an open channel flow, there is a, um, a very important governing parameter, which is the fraud number, FR, computed by equation 44. 
The Fraud number is the ratio between V, that is the velocity of your flow, and a certain quantity computed as square root of G times Y. We can distinguish three cases. Fraud less than one. It is known as subcritical flow. And in a subcritical flow, inertial effects are smaller than the gravity ones. Fraud larger than one, which is called supercritical flow, where gravity effects are, la are larger than inertial ones. And then fraud equal to one, which is known as critical condition. The quantity square root of G times Y is also known as celerity of the flow. Is um, a way to measure the speed through the one a certain perturbation will propagate in your flow. What do I mean? Imagine that you start throwing some stones in a lake still water, waves will propagate in the lake, right, from the source of the perturbation in a circular way. This because the lake is still. But what happens if the lake is moving? Please have a look at this graph. We can distinguish four cases. The first one is the still water. You throw your stone, and then waves will propagate. In every direction, you will have the same velocity of propagation of the perturbation. Do you agree? Then you don't throw stones in a still lake, but in a river. In a river that is undergoing a subcritical condition. So the velocity of the flow is smaller than the celerity. You start throwing your stones. Your waves of propagation will be elongated. Some waves will go leftward. Some waves will go rightward. Then you throw your stones in a river in a critical condition. Waves will not propagate anymore upstream. We only go rightward. And then, if the flow is subcritical, you have a, a more fancy thing where waves will detach from the point where you have thrown your stone. A very important thing is that when you have a subcritical flow, you have hydraulic communication between downstream and upstream. It means that you have a communication between left and right. From the critical condition on, you will not have any more this hydraulic communication between the two sections of your river. This is the last information I wanted to give you. And see you for our last lecture together next time. Ciao. Give me one second.